right, I'm going to do a bottle form like that one upstairs. And I was talking about how I use, you know, paper templates and stuff. And this is basically the template that I'll use for that. And I have, over the years, I just keep gathering these things. But this is my template book. You are well ordered. See, there's that gothic mm -hmm. window from the Frankenstein piece. Um, these are like more of a free form. And I got great big giant bottles I've done. Big forms. Little bottles. Other shapes. There's the tea boxes. Sometimes I do them and um, I don't necessarily like them and then go back and revisit. That's why this one's called The Best. Because apparently that one worked out better than the others. So you still keep the ones that you, at the time, yeah. you, you just never know. You for, just don't, yeah. Yeah, so I can just keep making more. And, and, and I do all these, you know, just draw them out with T squares and stuff like that. There's that hump bottle, that's the side. There's one of the straps. And if I get one that I like a real lot, I'll throw it on the Xerox and um, enlarge it up. And this is just that manila folder material. Mm -hmm. it, if you leave it on the clay for a while, it starts to buck a little, but for the most part, um, it goes back flat. These were um, some bowls. These are cool. Um, I got these cereal bowls and what I did is I made a template of it. So um, you take that off and I can make the clay sheet like this and I put all my graphics on it. Then I take the cereal bowl and I cover it with paper towel or with um, newspaper and then I can wrap my clay on there and now I get this cylindrical mm -hmm. kind of form with all the graphics on it and stuff. There's like, I think this is a, a cone, I've got yogurt cups, all sorts of things. You let it dry completely on top of the bone? Um, the I dr to leather hard. And then the, the base of it on that one, I actually throw the base on the wheel with like, um, you know, for the foot of it. And then I can attach that to the base. Uh, there's the coffins. There's postage stamps. I did some giant postage stamps. There's explosions where the words go in and stuff. Letters that I cut out. There's the sprockets for the tea cans. Um, I did some houses, some house shapes mm -hmm. that were kind of based off the Monopoly house. I got to do this factory one yet. That's going to be cool. So that's kind of the, the template story, but I save all those. And what I would do is I would go to the I would go to the grocery store and stuff like that. And you'd be looking at shampoo bottles and perfume bottles, <laughs> looking at all these cool shapes, and say, "Oh, how can I make that out of clay?" You bring uh, your yeah, yeah, and the camera. Yeah. I buy it and then return it. You know, I got a picture I needed. <laughs> so this is what we're going to do. And what I did is I rolled out some clay ahead of time just to make sure that it's the right dryness, but I'll show you my process. And I'll just roll out a piece of clay. You know, usually I just slap the clay down on the on here and I get it thinned out a bit. And it would be thicker. But I use, um, for the most part, I use paper. I use uh, an old sheet of drywall for what I'm going to roll out on. I don't want any texture on it. And I've created these strips of wood I didn't have a slab roller when I started out, so I created these and the OCD. I color coded them, and I've got numbers for progression. Um, so I did, did that. So I'll just find one that's pretty close to it. And I do have a small one. What happened is I started to get to a bigger scale. You know, when you start getting up like that big to throw a sheet of clay, it's, or roll out a sheet of clay, it, it's hard to, to roll it out nice and, and consistent. So um, I knew if I went up in scale, I needed a slab roller. So I got like a little tabletop one, and I can just roll out the sheets. I still prefer, um, and I, this is just a dowel from, from Home Depot, and I start in the middle. I put a sheet of paper top, sheet of paper bottom. 
and I'm going to go right at the middle. And I'm going to push down and I'm going to go halfway out, come back halfway to me. So that means I only have to push that, all that clay halfway and not the whole way. And I work, I call it a work and turn, as I peel this up and I rotate it so that it's like 90 degrees and it's flipped over and then I go to my next size and I take a fresh sheet and I do the same thing right in the middle pull it out to me now the paper, what's great about the paper is it's taking a little bit of the moisture out each time and I take a fresh sheet of paper each time because I don't want to put it down and get those wrinkles. Sometimes you get wrinkles in there and when you're working as thin as this is, those wrinkles can turn into like perforation areas where it's really easy for the clay to, um, I thought I had some more, real easy for the clay to break. So that's what we got. Yeah, pass that around. What happened is that yeah, I'd have all these scraps left over when I made a piece and I wanted to do something with the scraps so I thought I wonder if I can reassemble them. So I tried it and what I did is I just butted them together and then rubbed it across flipped it, did the same thing on the other side and picked it up <laughs> and I couldn't believe it so now I was like I had all like the, these scraps. Now I'd just take this and I, you know, impress it. So if I was ever out of clay, I just start assembling it together. Ah. Now I could actually probably even take that little tiny hump off. But yeah, that, the clay is incredible. I it's love this clay. Just water and clay, or is you add anything to it? Just water, just water and clay, yeah. Um, my studio is pretty simple. I, I use um, I use like gift clay, anything that somebody's given me, and then I use this 99G. Um, so when I'm throwing on the wheel, I keep this open by there, and I'm throwing stuff, and I get that beautiful slurry. You know, that stuff that is the best. And I just get it in there, and that's what all that is. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> to the point where if I run out, I take like a ball of clay and get my hands wet and I just rub the clay and, then I, and just to build up that, that again. And it makes sense because it's the same clay that you're putting it together with. Um, so it, it makes sense. Okay, so that's how I make the sheets of clay. To do the um, impressions, is a little different process. What I did is I rolled out some sheets of clay before we went upstairs and I just kind of threw on this and cut them out loosely to make sure that I had pieces that would be one for the front, one for the back and then this or this can be the base and then I'm gonna have to have sides and that's what this longer piece is for is the sides. We're going to concentrate on the on the bottle form, and then I'm going to do the the neck last. I do the neck last because I hate doing the neck. What's your work time? Like, do you have a set time before everything is too stiff, or it you know it depends on the humidity. If if it was ideal, what, the perfect situation is I would roll all these out like this, and then I put them on my tabletop and I'd take a couple of um, dry cleaner bags and I'd put them on top of it and I'd come back the next day 
and then I'd do my next step. And they would all acclimate, so they're all about the same amount of moisture. Because even here now, I've, some of them I'm feeling are a little stiffer and some are a little softer, and it, it can kind of make the piece shrink a little bit more on one side than the other. So, I was thinking last night, I was thinking I want to do the widow with this flower background. So in my mind, I'm picturing, you know, this, if this is the piece, I think this will all fit. It is something like that. We'll try. So that will be what we're going to do now. So what I'll do is I will start with her. And I use WD-40. I've tried cornstarch. That works fine for certain things. But it also tends to plug up some of the little the holes in here as a releasing agent. I've tried cornstarch. I've used PAM. Um, it's a vegetable shortening sort of thing, and that just sort of seems weird to put that on a metal stuff. Um, so i kind of gone to this WD-40, and I've been pretty happy with that. Um, now this, this thing, it shoots out, so I'm going to cover it up a little bit like that. And I use a toothbrush to work it around. And this is a broken printing plate. There's a couple pieces missing, so I always have to hand draw parts of it. I think that's actually enough. So I'm going to go ahead and put her right there. I'm just sort of eyeballing this. Now, why would you do her first and the flowers, the background last? Ah, because I will show you. The, um, the neat thing about this particular plate, in my studio the way I have also, is I have like a light set up here like on an arm, uh -huh. a light bulb, and it casts here. And the clay is so thin that I can actually see where I've pushed already. Mm -hmm. And the light's not too bad here. We can probably see a little bit of that. But you can start to see the relief oh, of where okay. she's at. And if you've done any kind of like silk screen printing, mm -hmm. where you've got that, uh, oh, what's the word? I've drawn a blank on it. Um, where you align the different sheets. Registration. Registration, exactly. That's where I'm going to be going with this. Now, I've done this particular plate a lot of times. And I know that I need to push on her lips and her eyes. And I always have trouble with some of this hair. I try to avoid the cheek because there's a double depth down there that messes me up. So you get to kind of know some of this stuff. And there's a lot of little tiny detail here. OK, so before I pull it off, what I do, I take something, I could use a pencil, I could use whatever, is I draw her outline where she's at. Sometimes I use the roller. That's a pretty good one. Now you can see where there's chunks of it missing and there's funny little things. I just use my finger as an eraser and like this bump here. I just go around and around, just take that out. This part here that's missing on her veil. I'll just draw that in. Okay. Now, I want to put this flower background in there, but if I, I've done that outline on the back so that I can register it, because I can't press anywhere I've already pressed or it'll, it'll eliminate that impression. So what I'll do, set that there, and I have to kind of align this where I think it might be, and I'm kind of 
guess in a bit on this. But what I do know for sure is that if I press anywhere in there, I'm going to lose it and there'll be flowers instead of girl. So I just go right up there to the edge and press. So I got all the flower stuff all around her. I can just blend that away and that was from the edge of the plate. And I'm not worried about, you know, like some of these old printing plates, you'll get like colors come up off the ink and that, it'll all burn away. So when we put this on there, that's kind of where we're going with it. And then I can kind of play around with how I want to crop it. If I want to have her more central, or maybe I want to move it up like that. And I'm thinking, I use this a lot. It's called, it says, what's happening? And I can put that in there too. And I'll just have it bleed right off. Oh, I might have pushed too hard. Keep the show moving. This is individual pieces of type. I bought, you know, in printer's type, and then I made my words, and then I use the same phrase often, so I've taped it together as a block. So I have it ready all the time. I also have, while we're talking about it, my name, when I do my name, I bought little tiny letters, mm -hmm. and I made my name, and this is what I use on the bottom. And it's all crazy glued together with a couple of washers, <laughs> and, we were wondering how you made that. Yeah. It's a beautiful stand. It works out good. I'm going to do Frankenstein in the back. We'll just have Frankenstein in the back. Um, I had gotten a bunch of logo, or a bunch of printing blocks off of eBay, and there's this really cool one. It had this F with a crown. And I said, "Oh, that is so perfect," you know. And so I did it, and then my friends started kidding me about, "Oh, it's the Fisher King." Blah blah blah. I said, "Well, maybe. Yeah. Okay, we'll go with that." And it's like four years later. I'm at a workshop, and somebody says, "How come you got that Frigidaire logo on the bottom?" I go, Frigidaire logo, and apparently it was an old Frigidaire logo from like the 1960s that ran for like two years and then they outdated it, and I had no idea. I thought it was just some little insurance company or something like that. Well, I had to redo it. Okay. That's a good one. That's a good one. Now I got to do the sides. And I do the sides with, oh, this is stiff too. I do them in two pieces on these round ones. Um, if we've got, this is going to be our shape. I'm going to do a side that comes up here and stops at the neck, and a side that comes up here and stops at the neck. And I'm going to use this. I, I think it's an old wallpaper block, I'm not sure. There was a time on eBay where everything was really cheap when it came to these printing plates. And I think I got this for like $4, $5. And it, I didn't look at where it came from, it actually came from France. <laughs> so my shipping was like $15, but still $20 and it's become one of my favorites. Now you, you see this stuff and it's all like, it starts at like $50 and stuff. So this will be the texture and I hope this works, but I'm not going to push too hard. This one's fairly sharp because it's all metal. So if you can picture, this is the bottle front and there's going to be these sides. I'm going to do the sides right now. And how I do it is, depending on how tall the piece is, depends on how thick it should be. I'm going to use this as my measurement for how thick it is. That'll be my width. This is another godsend. It's a T-square, but it's got this ridge on here. Yeah. So I just slap it against here, and then I make my cut. 
and it's a perfect 90. And I'm going to make another one here. These aren't going to be my final cuts, but this gives me the potential for where I'll start. Okay, now we're going to cut these out. We're going to set those right there for now. Oh, let's do this. This is the bottom part. That's going to be where the signature goes, the base of it. And I'll just go and cut these because it can be the same width. Now, when I cut this, when I made these, I, I saved the negative out of it too. And I use that as like a little window. And I can kind of position it to see how I want it to be. And then I stick that on there, pop that out. And then I cut around. Now what I do as quickly as I can, put a little water on that just so that it's soft. It's a little stiff and I don't want it to crack. If the clay was softer, I wouldn't do this, but I'm trying to prevent a crack here. So I take these, and I lay them like that, so that they will start to dry in the final shape. Because it's a lot easier to assemble these thin little pieces all together if they're nice and stiff and they're going in their final shape. So we'll set that there, do a little clean up, and then let's cut the back. Sometimes when it's getting dry like this, I'll just run my finger around and just kind of try to pack in that so I don't get any little crack start. Okay, now we're ready to put it together. I'm going to start with the base. And I'll make my first cut where I think it will be. And basically in my mind, I'm figuring I'm going to have a butt joint for the sides. So that'll be there. I want to have about that much distance. Put a little mark on there. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little bit of water and I'm going to this. I can't use, I rarely use um, like a pin knife or anything like that to score. I pretty much use uh, a toothbrush, whether I'm doing cups, whether I'm doing whatever. Um, I just need that surface scuffed up a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll just put a glob of this stuff there. And then a glob on here. Oops. I want to do this. Scuff that up. And I put on quite a bit. And then I don't usually tip it over like that. Then I get it in place and then I'll just rock it back and forth till I feel it bite. I'm trying to keep it fairly straight. I did a lot of painting in my career and paint brushes are very, it's, a, it's a, 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 a tool that I really like. So you'll see in a lot of this finishing stuff, I use a toothbrush a lot, or pardon me, a paintbrush a lot. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to clear off a lot of this slurry with this paintbrush. Now we're going to go up the sides. I think this one. This is pretty stiff now. It kind of wants to stand. That's ideal. So, 
score all that. And now, I'm going to kind of approximate where this is at. Again, this awesome tool. I just set it up against there and I kind of line it up where I think it's supposed to be and I cut straight down using it as a guide. Now I get my glue. I put a lot on. I'd rather have too much on because I can always take it off. Um, and I want that to be a good solid joint so I puddle it on. This is a little thinner than I usually use, but it must just be fresher. And I'll blob it on here. I have this very, well, you know, if, you, if you're in a studio by yourself, a lot of things go through your mind. I have this strange thing that goes through mine where it's two, three hundred years from now, maybe it's a thousand years from now, and they're going through these, my studio remnants, and they keep finding these bottles that I've made. And they're all impressed because of the quality of the building of it. That, you know, look at this. It's like all these nice seams and that. And then, I'm telling this story too early actually, and then when you go to put the top on, the seams show because I can't get inside and clean up the seams because I got the top on. And I picture they're all French. Oh, look at <laughs> We found another one. Bring it in, it's from him. Are you sure? Yes, look at the seams. Look at the seams. What about the top seams? Oh, they're messy. It was that assistant again. <laughs> so if you got crummy seams on it, it's because I had a bad assistant. So the first swipes I do, clean that up. And the second one I come back and I kind of, if there's a spot that's a little gunky, I'll kind of, gunky, sorry. I'll kind of push it down and push it into place. So it's got like the same reveal all the way around it so that I don't have like some parts are going wobbly in and out so I can kind of use that the, the uh, paintbrush to kind of push it into place get this all scuffed up the part that sticks up dries fast because it's thin so I try to re-wet it and kind of push it out a little bit more. That's more or less the right spot. A little bit of guesswork at this point. Okay. Again with the toothbrush. Sometimes I don't cut this here till the very end. I'll wait, cut it, but I was feeling really confident. So went for broke on it. And I'm just kind of tucking it and pushing it where it is, and at the same time, I'm pushing it down, feeling that bite so that it doesn't want to move. And I got to cut a little bit. Now I could actually cut these together. And they should fit perfectly together. I'm just trying to get this gunk off of here. And then I've got to throw a whole bunch in there. Okay, 
Now I will scuff. We're going to put that other side onto here. So I'm going to scuff all this stuff up. Now, before I put that down, sometimes I take like a, a stick and I'll just press it against here and then I'm going to take my thumbs and what I want to do is I just want to straighten this wall out a little because it's getting all wiggly and I'll just kind of clean it up that way. Same thing on this side. I put it on thick again. I wish it wasn't so runny. You get that kind of like leather surface. Sometimes the clay is not, you know, it's not dry underneath, but this scuffs that all up. Makes it wet and soft again. So that when I put that slip on, it'll absorb in there. And the whole thing kind of acclimates the, makes it soft again. This is for all the marbles now. And I just try to, I'm, I'm happy. I got it down. <laughs> um, and now I just kind of take my time and kind of look at it from all around, trying to get it centered as best I can. Because I want it to have the same reveal all the way around. Now another thing I do sometimes is I stand it up and I got that paper under it so I can kind of stand it up and I can still shift this a little bit try to get it so it'll be as vertical as possible or at a 90 degrees so it's not like curved. That's pretty good. So I just the next thing I do is I got to secure that panel to those sides and I just go around and tap it right above where that edge is. Ah, that popped out. That's that's a pretty good bind. It's 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 bound on there pretty good. That'll clean it up. And if there's some that are buckled in to are pushed out too far I can kind of push them back in straighten them out like here's one that's kind of pushed out a little bit too much I'll try to push it in with this so that it fouls parallel with that edge Now there's air trapped in there, which is helping keep it from sagging too much. And I'm going to leave that in there for a little while yet, while we keep working because it kind of structurally helps it. Okay. Now I'm going to clean up these edges. That's just a really soft, worn out elephant ear sponge. There. That's cleaned up pretty good. Now there's a, aesthetically there's a problem with it from, from my point of view is that when you look at it, it's like kind of caved in. It's like, you know, it doesn't feel like it's alive. It doesn't feel like it's full. And Pipenberg, my friend Robert Pipenberg says that all pots should kind of expand out. They should be alive. And I really agree with that. I think that's true. So when I put the hole in it, let's see, what do I want to use? I'm using my pen knife again. Oh, there it is. I'll put the hole in it right where I'm going to put the neck at. And try to gauge the center of this. 
and I'm just going to cut like a little tiny hole but then I'm going to blow into it and it's thin enough, I'll do it this way, it's thin enough that you can see it expand get to the hole <laughs> and then I'll just leave it like that and I really to me that just feels right it just feels so much better than when it was like dead tastes good too <laughs> now some now, if you see like little lines that don't feel quite right you can just set this and try to rub it against there to kind of straighten any of those out. I'm at, at this point now, what I want to do is I'm moving to a point where I, don't, I won't be touching it anymore until it gets stiff again. So I'm just doing all the things that I absolutely have to do that I can't do once it's leather hard. If there's a little down here there's this foot starting to come in a little bit so I'll just kind of bend him out a little bit I won't be able to fix that later on this has got a funny little twist right there I can see that I want to get rid of okay that's pretty good but the only thing left now is the neck. I'm gonna put that like that. Now if this was at my studio, I'd set this aside. Do we have one of those turntable things? Is it like a turn and I would put it on, on, on there. Do you make multiples on the bottom? Sometimes I do, yeah. But I can't do multiples of that size. I can dries do. Out too much. Yeah, yeah. There's just there's too much time involved in it, and it, it dries too fast. But I'll do like small ones, and I'll do like three or four at a time, and I keep throwing the plastic on it and that. But I, these here, they just seem to be complicated. They just demand attention. After I've made it, I'll put it in this, and. Um, it creates kind of a little terrarium, you know, it's like a little little moisture barrier. And what happens is everything now will re reacclimate to that same amount of moisture. Um, and you'll see where the moisture will start to actually collect on the bag, take like a day. I'll just flip the thing inside out so the moisture is on the other side. And drop it back down on it. And I'll come back in a day or two and do that. And what's happening is that I'm pulling moisture out of it real slowly, but the whole thing is shrinking together. Like if you've thrown like a teapot or something like that, and you got like a bone dry spout, and then the rest of it's still wet, you, you're, you're kind of starting to incur some cracking because you got stress because it's two different sizes from when it was originally made. So I, if I make a teapot, if I make cups, if I do any of that stuff, this is kind of that process because I want this piece to shrink together all at the same time. So let's make a, we're going to make the, um, the neck. And I think I alluded that I hate making necks. Um, I, I don't mind it so much anymore because <laughs> um, I've got a couple little cheats that I do, but there was a time when, how I would make them, oh, i got to qualify it. I would roll out a sheet of clay and then try to wrap it around a brush after I did a texture and it always would crack and by the time I'd fill it in with that the, um, the cracks would be all glopped up and it, it just looked terrible. So I wanted to figure out a new way. So I have taken a, a brush and this is going to be, uh, I'm going to get the clay around here. This is basically going to be the inside of the spout or the inside, yeah, inside of, the, of the, the neck for this. And I'll take some clay like this. It's still good and soft. And I'm going to put it right around here. Put it right around here. And 
it takes them off till I get about the right size. And now I'm just going to keep working this until it's pretty universal, pretty about the same thickness all around it. Trying to keep it tight to that paper. And if I push too hard, hard it'll stretch, but I can just sort of kind of roll it, start to smooth it out. How I do it is this is I'm going to have like a I want to have the texture stop before it gets to the end, so I will start by and I move it a little bit and I rock it and I move it a little bit and I rock it, rock it, I'm trying to keep that lined up and it's starting to buckle. That's not too bad. It's not horrible. So what I would do is take this, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. I'll put this right in with the piece. And then I'll put my black, my bag on it. And I'll let it sit for a day or so. I'll let them get good and hard. And then when it's time, we're going to pretend this is nice and stiff. And the same thing with this. I'll cut this opening. And again, I just glop this thing up with just a ton of this stuff. Same thing here. And again, just like before, wiggle it around till it bites. And just like I did on the sides. So I don't have that be wet. I clean it all up. That's a really pathetic neck on this thing. If I have cracks. I use the brush and you can kind of beat it back and forth and smooth out anything that you don't like on it. I don't like that neck, but that's the process. So that would go under the bag and I almost forget about these sometimes. You know, I, I'll check like every couple of days. I'll pull the bag off, sometimes put a fresh one on or turn it inside out. And it might be a month before I actually get into um, finishing it off. And to finish it off, I have brought one more piece. Has anybody used vinegar before for seams? That's my, my favorite. This is a piece that's damaged but um, it's a simple process and I use this for any time I join anything uh, cups teapots any kind of handles or whatever I go around every single joint this is bone dry and I soak it up real good and then I use a wood tool and I just pack that in it can't be a structural fix. It's a cosmetic fix. It just gets rid of those little cracks that can show up no matter how good a job you do. A lot of times I won't even see the crack. And I just use white vinegar. It's just, it's not, it's the watered down stuff that you get in the store. And that's kind of it. Go around when that's um, 
totally bone dry. I'll put it in a kiln and I fire to 06 for bisque. Um, most of my work is 06 glazes or raku glazes and those all go to 06 again. So whatever its size it comes out at uh, the kiln, it's, um, that's the size it'll be when it's finally fired. I have fired these to, I've made some uh, flasks and things like that um, and I've fired them to cone 10. They fired beautiful. Um, the, it's, a, it's a great clay body. Like I said, I, would, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without that clay body because I have tried it with some of the others. Um, it's the raku part. I've made um, just about all these shapes out of other clays like terracottas and stuff like that and they all pretty well work pretty good. Um, the grog sometimes it gets to be a problem because you go to wipe it down and, and all of a sudden you've got those little chunks in there. Um, but besides that, they seem to work. The, it's a good little process. Oh, boy, that's an ugly neck on that thing. <laughs>